Sometimes in life, you've got to put yourself outside your comfort zone. In my two and a half years of hosting this podcast, I've become rather used to asking the questions and dodging the ones I'd rather not answer. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's Chief Political Correspondent, and today on Chopper's Brexit podcast, I've made the foolish mistake of agreeing to be interviewed after I've asked a few questions on my own. And even more terrifyingly, it's in front of a live audience of teenagers at St. Clement Dane School in Hertfordshire. You can probably hear I'm on the 857 train to Chorley Wood to meet my interviewer, David Gork, the former Tory MP. Until December, he was, of course, the MP for the constituency of South West Hertfordshire. He held down three cabinet posts in government, Justice Secretary, Working Pensions Secretary, and, of course, Chief Secretary to the Treasury. He's beloved of ministers and advisers because, faced with a crisis, they could send out David onto the airwaves. The cry will go up in Whitehall, uncork the gawk. The time has come to uncork the gawk. There he was on TV and radio, calming it all down. But then he sacrificed all of his good public service for Brexit. Last year, his political career kind of imploded after he fought plans to put a no-deal exit back on the table. And now, well, we're uncorking the gawk once again and turning the tables for this special edition of the show. What you're going to hear is three sets of questions. First of all, I ask him questions about how he is after the election and how last year went. Then, turn the tables. He'll be asking me questions about, well, I'm not sure. And finally, the students of St Clement Dane School in Chorley Wood will be asking me their questions, fielded by their tutor, Mrs Brown. I hope you enjoy it. The next station is Chorley Wood. Now, David, are you a Brexiteer now? Well, first of all, Chris, welcome back to, to Trawleywood and good to see you again. And thank you for that kind introduction. Well, look, we're, we're clearly going to leave the European Union. We're going to do that in a week's time. Uh, that is going to happen. I am not filled with huge enthusiasm because I think it's a mistake for the country. But that battle has been won by the Brexiteers and the challenge now for the country is to leave in the most sensible way possible, the way that is good for the country, uh, that means that there are still plenty of good opportunities, good jobs, the country is prosperous, and uh, the the country can come back together again because Brexit has been a very divisive process. Mm. Uh, With some relief, I think, come back together with some relief. Yes, I hope so. I I hope hope that's right. But to some extent, that's going to depend on how it plays out in the next few months. And the idea that, if you like, Brexit is kind of is done, that it's all behind us. I don't believe it's true because there's still some really big decisions that need to be made. Yeah. So we're leaving on Friday. What are your plans next Friday night? With Nigel Farage in Parliament Square? He's having a big party. Yes, I, I possibly won't be joining the party. I've not had an invitation. Um, it's free. It's free. If you like Brexit, you could just you turn, turn up. up. I'm, I'm not sure I'd be overly welcome. I, I have agreed to do a little bit of broadcasting on yes. the Friday evening, so I'm going to do not that. to be a gloomy person. Yeah, I, yeah I'll be the person. I'll be hanging out in the kitchen. Yeah. You're you know, the guy not drinking at the party, exactly, aren't you? Sitting there yeah. and driving. In the, in the kitchen, sort of saying, you know, do you think the music's a bit loud? <laughs> uh, can we, you know, can we all go home now? Yeah. But yes, yeah, so I'll do a little bit of broadcasting, then I'll... Then I'll Come home, but I, I, I won't be. Um, I won't be early night. Early night could be. You won't mark Freedom Morning, which is Saturday morning, with a full English breakfast, like uh, like Brexiteers will be doing. Really, is that the thing <laughs> to do? I'll, I'll probably have a full continental. <laughs> if you look back now on last year, looking back on last year, do you regret your stand over the No Deal Brexit? I don't. Uh, I mean, obviously, I feel sadness at no longer being a member of Parliament. I thoroughly enjoyed being an MP. It was a real privilege. It's a seat that, you know, obviously I already lived in and, you know, was was home as well. So uh, at one level, I I obviously miss that. Um, But I look back at the decisions I made and you know, there are some things I probably would have done differently but by and large on the big decisions I think I was right I do think that perhaps the biggest decision of all was the decision to support the Ben Act hmm. um, and well, what was that again for the yeah just just to explain that so this this was in early September uh, and at that point the country was due to leave the European Union on the 31st of October 
And if no deal had been reached, we would just automatically have left the EU without a deal on that date. And I think that would have been a disaster for the country. And it was clear that the government was prepared to do that, that it wasn't going to try to extend our membership again. Mm -hmm. And uh, a group of MPs across the parties came together, uh, devised a, 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 a piece of legislation, created a law that essentially stopped that from happening without the consent of Parliament. So essentially said to the government, if you have not got a deal, you've got to go back and extend Article 50, uh, which was the thing that sort of drove our departure from the EU. And had that law not been passed, I remain convinced that the government would have left mm. without a deal on the 30th. But you paid a very high personal price for that because you were thrown out of the party, you rebelled against the party, and then, well, that was it. Are you a member of the party now? Uh, no, I, I resigned as a member of the Conservative Party after 29 years in order to stand as an independent. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so I ceased to be a member of the Conservative Party. Once you've lost the whip, once you cease to be a Conservative MP, unless you get the, the whip back, you can't stand as a Conservative candidate in the next general election. So once a general election was called in early November... Uh, and I did not have the whip back. There was no prospect of me being the Conservative candidate in this constituency. I didn't request the whip back. In my view, I thought it was heavy-handed to remove the whip. Have you lost friend over Brexit? Um, I, I don't know. I, there's, there's, it's hard to tell. You know, there's, there's quite a few people who I have seen who have got very different views from mine, but we've remained on good terms. Mm. There's some I just, I suppose, I haven't seen, so I don't, yeah. you know, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Boris Johnson hasn't phoned you up since the election. It, no, no, I'm, I haven't had a phone call from no. the Prime Minister. That, that might be coming. Yeah, it might be. I'd be surprised. <laughs> we weren't particularly close. It would be fair to say. Did you ever really think about joining the Lib Dems back in September? I think I rang you about that that story, and it didn't appear because it wasn't true. But I thought it was a bit. Something written in the air at the time, wasn't there? In, in September, once the whip had been withdrawn, then it looked as if you know, it was possible that you know, we would have a general election, that I still wanted to continue as the Member mm. of Parliament, and whether there was a way of coming to some accommodation with the Liberal Democrats so that they would stand aside for me uh, and not stand here. So, yes, I was in conversation with the Liberal Democrats, but it wasn't about joining the Liberal Democrats. It was about a deal. A deal. Um, and as it was, they stood against you here, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. Yeah. And that was a problem in the numbers when we got to the final analysis. Y yes. I mean, it certainly didn't help. Um, they thought long and hard about not standing against me. Mm. And I think they were split and we lobbied them. And, you know, there were a lot of senior Liberal Democrats who felt that they shouldn't have stood against yeah. me. But in the end, they decided to do so. And during the campaign, you became this viral superstar, didn't you? Uh, well, you, you yes, with a bit of help. With, with the, a bit of help, with, yeah. Yeah, with, with Jim. Who's yes. Jim? Well, uh, Jim's my father. And uh, he came down to, to visit during the campaign. And I said, why don't we just do a little video yeah. Uh, talking to each other. And so we had this sort of video and, and my father just sort of talked about how, you know, he's very dismayed at where the Conservative Party was and I don't live here, but if I did, I'd certainly vote for you. And it sort of went on and on and on. And then at the end of that, I said, well, thanks, Dad. And he went, you're welcome, son. Um, you're very um, funny. Anyway, we put it out on Twitter and um, uh, it sort of went a bit viral. And so far, it's had 800,000 views. Yes. So he's, he's become a bit of a... Twitter star. Do you stand by your remarks in the election? You said that a Boris Johnson majority government would lead to a no-deal Brexit and devastate large parts of the UK economy. Well, I think there's still a, a really big risk of that. I, I think that the government has been consistent on two things. One is that it won't extend the implementation period. So just to be clear, we will leave the European Union next Friday, but nothing will change until the end of the year, because all the rules will continue to apply. So, so there won't be a particular problem on the following Saturday or anything like that. Um, but the implementation period is the period of time in which the, the future relationship with the EU, a comprehensive free trade agreement, is supposed to be negotiated. Now, nearly every expert says that there is not enough time to negotiate that deal before the end of the year. 
and the Prime Minister has said he's not going to extend that period. So I think that's one problem. There's a crunch point coming. There is a crunch point coming. And then the second point is that he's, he's very keen to diverge from EU rules. And yeah. I think you can do that. That's perfectly possible. But that makes the deal even more complicated. And the EU will want certain protections. Yeah. And I'm not sure that Boris Johnson will be prepared to give those. So I, I worry that in the end... Yeah. Those negotiations might break down and we end up with a with essentially a no deal or a managed no deal Brexit at the end of the year. And what are your personal plans? You're wearing that burgundy tie. Now that was the colour of your party. I yes, it was a party. Well, it was yes. vote David Gork. Yeah. Yes. The yeah. campaign, yes, I chose burgundy. But I chose to be fair, I chose burgundy because I already had you know, a tie and a scarf that was that Very colour. nice scarf, actually. Yeah, very nice scarf. In fact, I've got another burgundy scarf yes. for Christmas as well. And your battle so bus was a full galaxy. Full galaxy, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, sort of, um, well, basically the family car. Yeah, so family it, was all, car. it was all a bit sort of makeshift, you know, as you have to, when you run well, you won 16,000 votes. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is good for an independent. I mean, obviously I was in it to win. Yes. But, um, yeah, it was really pleasing. And to be honest, I, th- I thoroughly enjoyed the campaign. We got some fabulous volunteers from a range of yeah. political backgrounds. And people were very nice. And so mm. I was, you know, at the train stations on the high yeah. streets and uh, knocking on doors. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people were really supportive. Obviously, you know... What I'm, did you I, learn from it, this fight on your own? I, I, mean, I always knew that party machine and party profile sort of helps yeah. a great deal. Yeah. Um, it, it, in the end, that sort of party loyalty, the fear of Jeremy Corbyn was the big thing yeah. that helped the Conservative Party mm. in the general election. So I, I think that was the, the big thing that I, I kind of, mm. you know, learned from the process. But, you know, I, I learned that it can be done, actually. It can if you've got some, a small group of energetic, yeah. capable 150 people. people, you said, didn't you? I think. Yeah. But it starts off with a small team and then it yeah, builds yeah. up. And because of technology, social media, you know, people were just coming through, you yeah. know, were volunteering all the yeah. time. And it was great. Now, I've got some quick fire questions before my time is up. Who's the most famous selfie you've ever, ever taken with? Well, uh, I met Jason Isaacs. Good. You know the actor? Do you know, know him? You know, sort of during the campaign. Sure, there's a uh, blank look. Uh, that's actually a selfie. But he was, he, was, he was in all the Harry Potter yeah. films. What, what are you up to now? Are you watching loads of box sets? Uh, a few. So I, I was hoping to be watching the cricket this morning, but it's raining in Johannesburg, yes. sadly. Um, so yeah, watching a few. So I watched The Crown and yeah. currently watching Succession. So not a watching, bit more not watching Sex Education on Netflix. I'm, and... I'm not yet. No, no, my, no. my kids. Do you recommend that. it? No, I don't. And don't watch it with your kids either. No, um, no, I can imagine. Yeah. Perhaps you can tell him when you when you ask yeah. your questions. What were you like when you were at school? Uh, I were you was. Bookish? Mm. Yeah, quite bookish. So quite studious, quite well behaved. I think not a re- not a rebel. Yeah. Any of you on Megxit? Makes it. I um, I think it's really sad what's happened, mm. and it's quite hard to tell precisely what was going on. But you know, in the end, you know, a little bit like Brexit, you 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 can't have your cake and eat it. John Burko, peerage or not? Uh, I think um, I think by and large speakers should get a peerage, and I uh, I don't think he did everything right uh, by any means. But I, I worry about government withholding a peerage to the Speaker of the House of Commons mm. if it starts to become a way of influencing yes. how the Speaker behaves. There should be that division between executive and uh, exactly. legislature. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Foster on Twitter asked, do you still feel gawkward? Do I still feel gawkward? I'm, <laughs> I don't know what that even means. But... <laughs> I think in terms of look, where the government is, I'm, look, I still consider myself to be a Conservative, but you know, I'm a kind of critical friend of the... Mm. Uh, of the government. You might rejoin soon? I'm not, no, I'm not going to rush into that. Um, mm. So whether I rejoin or not. So I've got my criticisms of, of, of the government. So in that sense, I'm still being a bit awkward. And the Gawkward squad won't be a band, asked Political Graham on Twitter. Uh, knowing my musical abilities, there's <laughs> no. No, no risk of that. Tim Lawton, MP, former colleague uh, yeah. of yours. I asked him on Twitter last night for questions for you, mm-hmm. I should explain. Who, who's your best impersonation, not Ken Clark? Not Ken Clark. Well, you could do Ken Clark. Well, I don't know how many people would know what Ken Clark sounds like, but... Let's see. No, no, but uh, he's a very good boy, he's a boy, he does this, and he's a very, very good, great <laughs> man. And uh, William, uh, William Hague, I do a William Hague impersonation, mm-hmm. but everybody does a William Hague impersonation. <laughs> but again, I'm not sure how many people here will remember William Hague. Now, David O'Hanlon, um, he says, apparently not all politicians like answering this question, but how many children do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I have three. You have three. Two of whom are at this school. Okay, good. One of whom will be in September. And Peter Barnes asks, are you going on Strictly? Uh, no. In I the jungle? In the jungle. I have had no requests. I don't, I'm not sure reality TV is for me. Dancing is certainly 
not for me. Yeah. So um, I, I make Ed Balls look like um, you know, Rudolf and, Nureyev. And given this is probably my last question, I'll ask you, unless you have a political comeback, which I do hope you do. My final question to you is, tell me something I don't know. Tell you something you don't know. Well, I don't know what you know or do know, do I? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, so yeah. about me or just yeah, sort of just generally? What, what, give me a tip for life. A, a tip for life? Yeah. Stand up for your beliefs. Stand up yourself. for you. Well, I, yes, I go, go for that. Because actually, I mean, I think it's a point, but I've done speech days here as well. It's kind of, you know, why not me? Go, have a, give it a go. You know, why not you? Yeah, have a, have a crack at whatever you, you really And don't put career before, before your own, what you believe in, which you did last year. Well, look, I, 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 um, I made a choice. And I, for me, it was the right choice. And although I, I, I regret I'm no longer a member of Parliament, I feel very comfortable with the decision that I made and uh, mm. you know, looking forward to whatever the future holds. Well, David Gould, thank you. Save 50% and subscribe to The Telegraph as Britain embarks on a bright new future. Treat yourself to a standard digital subscription in our Brexit sale. Pay just £25 for your first six months of intelligent insight and trusted opinion. Subscribe today at telegraph.co.uk. Thank you for that. Now, David wants to ask me some quick questions before throwing it open the floor to you. David. Well, thank, thank you, Chris. And uh, now you are one of the country's leading political journalists, if I may say so. Very well respected by politicians and journalists. You just stood down, I think, as was it chair of the lobby? Yes, yesterday, yesterday, chair yesterday. of the lobby. Yep. Um, and chief political correspondent of the Daily Telegraph. What attracted you to becoming a, a political journalist? Well, when I was about the age of these students here, I, I just liked the I found I could write things clearly, and I like being able to have the information first. And I, I've always used my journalism to try and improve things for the people I write for. So I see you looking after your 80,000 people in southwest Hertfordshire. But I think as a telegraph, um, I've been able to try and care about what they care about. It's a degree of representation. It's not uh, democratic. But I find I've just got a lot of pride, and I'd just like to, you know, hold hold government and power to account in the same way a backbench MP might feel they do towards when you're in power. Well, you, you make the comparison with with mm. being a member of Parliament in terms of representing people and, and yeah. so on. Have you ever thought about becoming a member of Parliament? I think you'd been make a very good MP. Yeah, I have. I did think think here and then. I mean, I was once a member of a, of a political party. Uh, when I worked for a campaign group after journalist school. So I did politics at, at university and I went to Cardiff Journalist School and I had six jobs before I joined the Telegraph in 2003. And I did think about it, um, but it's never really come across. It strikes me very hard being an MP or becoming one because I think you've got, well, I know that you, unless you're, you're lucky enough to be where you live, you have to go and, and invest in an area many miles away from where you live. That costs lots of money. You have to rent a house there and be in the community to know what they care about before you can stand. And I've got children, as, as you have, and it just would take me away from them at weekends. So I really admire people who give a lot, you know, are able to put their family life to one side and be an MP. I think, you know, I was part of the other team that broke the MP expenses scandal, which is difficult for, for a lot of MPs, and it resulted in a third of MPs leaving Parliament in 2010. And I, my one regret is, I think, that we gave MPs, we allowed ourselves to, to judge them quite harshly after that. And I think we forget the idea of public service, which is always at the heart of what you do. Perhaps later on, could you imagine in you know, a few years down the line, yes. your children are a bit older? Do you, the, the, the sort of lure, yes. rather than being just a, a spectator, a yes, commentator, a participant, but a participant. Yeah, in, in the arena? Get on the were. field of play, yeah. yeah. Not a bad idea, Dave. Will you, will you advise me? I, I, well, I'm not, sure I'm, the right pers- I'm not sure I'm the right person to advise <laughs> yes. you, um, Chris. Well, the first, yeah, got... Until last year, you were yeah, well, doing really well. Fine, well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, well, there we got an exclusive that, you know, Chris Hope I'm aims what... to become a, a, yeah. a, a member of Parliament, and a minister beyond that, presumably. Beyond that, yeah, maybe minister. I mean, I'm probably, you know, I'm, I'm 48, I'm the same age as you, I think you're three weeks older than me. Um, and, and it shows. And it yeah. shows, yes, yes, it clearly shows. Yeah. Uh, yes, it'd be, it'd be interesting. I think, um, you know, do, do they want more white men in their late 40s in government? Don't they want different people nowadays? Am I representative of either future or the past? Well, there's a few white men in their late yeah. 40s who just left Parliament, so That's maybe there's, right. some, maybe there's, there's some vacancies yeah. there. The point about, you, you mentioned how you look to sort of represent, if you like, the views of the of the Daily Telegraph reader. I mean, for the, for the benefit of our audience here, how would you 
how, how would you describe, how do you imagine the, the, the sort of typical Daily Telegraph reader? Or who are they? What who are, are the reader? That's really interesting. So the, the, the average age of our reader of the newspaper, now we sell 330,000 copies a day of, the, of our newspaper. It's a big broadsheet newspaper. Um, and the average age of that readership, I think, is around 53 years old. That's the average age. So there's half above and half below that number. Is that a mean or a median? That's a median. A median, sorry, yeah. you should know if you're math students. Yeah. And then the average age of the online side, which is where the future is, we think, is about 43. Um, and that person of the newspaper lives here. Probably wearing corduroys, corduroy trousers. Corduroy trousers. And yes. what, what are their views? What are their, their views? I think they, well, they love their country. They're quite, they're traditional. They're low, definitely low tax. That's one of the key selling points. They want a tough government on crime, strong on defence. Uh, they're pro-marriage. They're probably more small C conservative on social issues, I think. Um, yeah, and they're quite well off, generally, of yep. the newspaper. But it's changing with the online side. And we sell... I think 30,000 or so within the M25, and then across middle England, we just sell out. I mean, we, you often you can't buy a copy of the paper off nine o'clock in a newsagent. So, it's a, yeah, it's, it's the heart of England, I think. And it's the heart of the, I do say England, because we're not that, that well-read in Scotland, um, maybe a bit of Wales, but I think we are the, I think also we see ourselves as the beating heart of the Conservative Party. Well, certainly the party mm. until this election, and of course, the party, I would say, your party, old party, has now moved 200 miles north in terms of its centre of gravity, away from the home counties into the Midlands, where, it's, where there are new voters there voting Tory. So do you think the Daily Telegraph might be less influential with the new Conservative yeah. Party than it has been up until now? I de definitely think so. I think there might be, uh, you know, looking forward, there could be a fissure between what the Telegraph thinks is a good thing and what the government thinks, because the government have to cement this blue wall of voters that they won in the north of England. And so the party, correctly, is more worried about them to cement the election victory in 2024. My worry would be they forget the core base of the party and there's a bit of disaffection amongst those people who will be our readers. OK, and that'll be a good opportunity, I guess, for the Telegraph to try to sort of put the case for its readers, will it? Is that, is that yes, the role well, I think the, the Telegraph There might be a tension. I mean, we don't want to speak out of turn. I think we see a lot of opportunity for the, the paper and our readership going north now because we can go with the party. If you want to vote Tory, we're the, we, we are where the debate happens inside the Tory party. Try, on, try our website or our newspaper. So more Daily Telegraph sales in northwest Durham. So yeah, why that's not? Yeah, said. totally. Yes. Now, you, you, you made the point about campaigning on things in which your readers really care about, and you get things like the, the Royal Yacht and the, yep. the, the coin for Brexit and so on. Are these issues that you sort of pick because you think the readers will care about yes. it, or do you personally, you know, if, if you weren't writing really for question. the Daily Telegraph, would you, would you still care about the Royal Yacht? I've been there for 16 years, and I think I, you do turn into a Telegraph person. You become a kind of creature of the newspaper, and you know how they, I suppose what you do is a, um, you interpret news and information the way, they, the way they think about things. And, then, and, and you sort of translate it into the way that, you know, so you help funnel it into, a lot of conservatives are always worried about the BBC. They say it's biased towards the left. Of course, the left say it's biased towards the right, which means it's doing a good job, the BBC, frankly, because both sides are attacking it. Yeah, so I suppose it does, it does filter the way you look at information. But I don't have the interaction that you have, we used to have with your weekly surgeries when you'd meet, you know, people in this room or their parents. And so, um, but I do, when I do talk to them, often once a year it's on the phone, we do the, do the charity phone in. They're just brilliant people. I mean, I would love to meet, I want to meet more to Telegraph readers, actually. So do you think you've been there, you know, so long? That, let, let's imagine, hypothetically, yeah. that, the, that another newspaper... The Guardian. Let, let's say The Guardian, okay. which is, you know, a left-wing yeah. uh, Guardian, completely different attitudes than Sarah. And they say, you know, you're the star news reporter. Um, we're going to give you a... You know, we're going to double your salary. We want yeah. you to come to The Guardian. Yeah. Do you think it's something that you could do and then you'd, you'd, you'd find yeah. other issues and sort yeah. of you'd be promoting well, vegan food or something like that? You I don't said, know. You said double your salary. Yes. So where do I sign? Yeah. <laughs> Straight away, out the door. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, I used to work, with, my, my career, if you're interested in this, is I used to work for Print Week, Construction News, and The Scotsman, The Herald, Business AM, before The Telegraph, I had joined in my 30s. And when you work for Print Week or Construction News, you know, I've never printed anything in my life or know how to print anything or built anything. 
but you just learn what they care about, these readers, and you try and work out what, what they want to know about. So I would, I would apply that discipline to The Guardian. So there's a question of being professional, if you like. Yeah, it's yeah. being professional. I mean, and it might be a good challenge to work for The Guardian for six yeah. months. I might do a job swap, mm. fish out of water, see how it goes. Do you think there's a risk that if people read newspapers that reflect their prejudices, and I you don't use that in a loaded way, but mm. you know, the people's preconceived views, that if they just read that, and then newspapers are determined to, if you like, provide people with what they want, mm. Uh, the, you end up with people just not taking on board information, evidence, contrary to what yeah. they already think. This is the echo chamber concern. Exactly. Now, it exists, within, I think, within newspapers because The Guardian published to cover things that we don't and vice versa. So, like, bin collections was a big issue of the past decade of reducing bin collections. We got obsessed about this at the Telegraph because it bothered our readers. You know, I wouldn't say it was a big issue in The Guardian because they thought it was a bit ridiculous. So it's, 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 it's a view... I think it's getting much worse with the echo chamber. The Twitter is so kind of left-wing. No one could quite believe how all those retweets on anger didn't result in votes, you know. I mean, Twitter is not the British public in the same way, nor is the Telegraph. In the defence of newspapers, I would say that um, with the way the algorithms work is that if you search for one thing on Facebook, often that means that next time you get suggested information following what you've searched. So bizarrely, although the internet is an infinite space, you get narrowed, you get into a funnel of information which isn't very wide. I think the Telegraph and the Guardian, the Daily Mail, the Times, and the Independent and the rest, they can curate information for you and you will read things on the, in our newspapers that you wouldn't have, wouldn't have looked for. Uh, and I think it's important that we always do challenge our re- readers with new ideas. But it's definitely, that's always a concern, the idea of reinforcing misconceptions. And that's something which we need to be aware of and think about. How would you deal with, say, a story that, that is important, but if you like is awkward or difficult for a particular point of view? I mean, let's take Brexit as yep. an example. And let's say, and this is a hypothetical yes. example, that there is an announcement of um, a big factory closure because of Brexit. It's, as you know, it's a concern that I have that there might be some of this happening, yep. but, but hasn't happened yet. But let's imagine that... It, uh, it did. You know, one of the iconic car manufacturers sort of pulled out of this country. How would the Telegraph treat that story, well, given that it's yeah. generally argued yeah. that you know, Brexit's all going to be fine? Well, it depends what they said, because I think that did happen. And I don't name the manufacturer, but that did happen, I think, last year, didn't it? When I think it was BMW pulled out production of their car and moved it to the Eastern Europe, I think. And then... That was half the story, because the other half was they were going to put a different car in a newer model. Mm-hmm. So high, they were going to, so the, the model they knew how to make went to the low, lower cost economy, and then they had this, they were going to have this um, new model made with better, better uh, train workers in Britain. And I'm some, I hope I'm right in saying it's BMW, but I often think there's, there's two sides to that story, and it would depend on what the manufacturers said. I think during, so you, you would you yeah. would you would look for the aspect of the story that was probably you see, less difficult. For, there's a, there's a, for there's a ne- innate bias in anyone. You see how you interpret information. So some would say, well, you know, the, there's a big joke was um, it was called hashtag despite Brexit. So whenever there was some good news last year, it'd be people would do hashtag despite Brexit because it was so gloomy. The, yeah, I think we need to reclaim news as being an objective thing because I think it, it got it got people were using it to make points last year and that became a worry. Is is there a a fear that sometimes newspapers just have power but no responsibility, as as, as Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister of the nineteen thirties, said? Mm. Yeah, the Daily Telegraph's been very influential in the Conservative Party becoming more Eurosceptic in Theresa May's deal not getting through. Mm. Um, uh, things might well have worked out very differently. Maybe the British people well, would, have, would right. not have voted for Brexit in the, the first place. Maybe we've never had a referendum. Do, do you ever worry that the position that the Daily Telegraph has taken, and you've been a key part of that, has, has really mattered to this country and, and, and could think, result well, in something overplay bad the, happening? mustn't overplay the importance of newspapers. When Stanley Baldwin was around, the sales are much bigger. I say we're 330,000 a, a day. I think we had a role to play. I think... Well, I do know the Telegraph was the only newspaper who didn't back Theresa May's deal, right? Everyone else did, up to the meaningful vote three that never happened in March last year. Everyone else backed it, we didn't. And there were 31 or Tory MPs who wouldn't back it. And I would argue that uh, holding the line against that deal produced 
messily, but eventually got to Boris Johnson to get a deal which now looks like it's Brexit because both sides are giving more. Um, there's more control in this country now about the kind of deal we want to do. We weren't tied to the European Union in the same way. So I think, I think that's, a, in terms of power without responsibility, that's a, that's a key question of all journalism because um, unlike David, who has faced and does, so would have faced a kind of complete, you know, a 360 performance review every five years with the election, we don't get that. But we, I suppose we would lose sales and we'd lose um, support amongst readership. And that, and that would, uh, but it's, always, it's a worry what you say there, but we try and stand on the right side of, of the angels. Chris, hey, thank you very much. It's, it's fascinating to, to learn that you want to join The Guardian and then go into <laughs> politics. So to double my salary. is the Double your salary. Writer, yeah. not, not the politics bit, I can promise you that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Christopher Hope. Thank you. So Yasmin has got a question for you. We're going to start with sort of Brexit-related questions. Would you agree that Brexit has placed Britain in a position of vulnerability, so essentially stuck between a rock and a hard place because we're desperate to diverge from the EU, but we're also desperate not to look as if we're pandering to the United States? Uh, yes, I think it does put us in a very difficult position. Uh, the, the way in which uh, the sort of you've got big, powerful trading blocks in the world, you've got China, you've got the US, you've got the European Union, it is cold out there. And sometimes if you want to get a good trade deal with the European Union, it makes it harder to get a good trade deal with the US because you've got to accept one set of standards or another and vice versa. So I think um, it does put us at risk. I hope it all works out. You know, I, I obviously want the country to succeed. The decision is made. But yes, we are you know, out a little bit on our own. And I think that will make us a less influential country than if we had remained as members of the European Union, where our influence within the EU was, I think, widely underestimated. It's also an opportunity that David is ignoring there to go and try and trade with other countries that are outside these main trading blocks. I read a report last week, there's thousands of companies want to set up in Britain because it's quite an interesting place on the edge of the European Union. Uh, you know, the opportunity there is quite great. I think we mustn't overlook that. Big issue next week with the Huawei decision. Now, that's this um, on your mobile phones made by Huawei. The Americans are trying to say we shouldn't allow this Chinese company into our 5G infrastructure because they're worried about security implications. And I think the UK government is going to say we can manage those risks, and that's going to annoy Donald Trump. So I think there's all sorts of testing points coming up in the special relationship, even though Boris Johnson will go there next month. There are, there are real tensions coming up, which David will know all about from last year, and how that has a bearing on the trade deal with America that they want to sign by, by July is one idea to get one agreed. We'll wait and see. Uh, do you think David Cameron was right to resign or should he have seen Brexit through? I think he should have stayed and seen it through. I think part of the problem was he resigned so quickly um, that they, and then Theresa May was elected in a kind of rush and Boris Johnson fell apart. And Michael Gove stabbed him in the back, as we know. Andrew Leslie then did a bad interview and couldn't stand I think, I think history will judge, though, that Brexit couldn't have happened without Theresa May's vacillation on it. By her trying to get a, a deal which everyone liked and it didn't work, it meant that created the conditions for Boris Johnson to come in with a clean answer. We're going to go, we're leaving, that's it. And without that chaos and nothing happening, without that, that it was three years, you wouldn't have had the conditions for Boris Johnson. So I think history will look kindly on uh, Theresa May as the, the person who delivered the Brexit for Boris Johnson. I don't think David Cameron really had much choice about <laughs> resigning. I don't think that the, the Eurosceptics, that the Daily Telegraph readers would have accepted a deal negotiated by David Cameron, who had led the campaign for us to remain. And the big difficulty with the referendum, and, and this is where one can make a kind of criticism of it happening at all, is that in the 2016 referendum, it wasn't clear what leave meant. So you had some people who were saying, you know, for leave, we want to have complete control of our laws and, you know, nothing to do with the European Union whatsoever. whatsoever. Others saying, well, why can't we be successful like Norway? Norway's not in the European <laughs> Union. Um, we could be like Norway and they're prosperous and successful, which is true, by the way. But Norway also signs up to an awful lot of laws. It respects the ECJ. Um, the regulations apply there. And it wasn't clear what leave meant. 
And I think it would have been a hopeless task for David Cameron. It turned out to be a hopeless task for Theresa May to deliver on a very vague idea, leave. You know, what does leave well, really mean? Brexit means Brexit. Brexit means Brexit. And, and, but it means different things to different people. And, and you know, for the hardcore, um, you know, it, it means a very pure Brexit. And I think that's where Boris Johnson is going to deliver us. But the purer the Brexit... The less we have to do with the European Union, the more disruptive it will be for the British economy and the less access we will have to European markets. Or there's more opportunity that way. Or not. Given that we are the generation who will be most affected by the long-term outcomes of Brexit, why do you think the idea of extending the vote to 16-year-olds was not entertained? Well, that's a question for the Conservative Party because Labour are quite keen to give the vote to 16-year-olds, as are other parties, but I don't know why the Tories don't support that. Well, I, I can uh, answer this question having been, you know, for a long time a Conservative. And the view is generally that Conservatives do less well with 16 and 17-year-olds. But then I left the Conservative Party and it would have helped me, I've no doubt, that if at the last general election 16 and 17 year olds were able to vote because they're more sort of remain orientated and so on. Look, I think you have to draw the line somewhere. You always have to have a, a cutoff point on age. There are many 16 and 17 year olds who are much better informed about the political world than those over the age of 18. But also you can identify 15 year olds who are really well-informed and thoughtful and have got, you know, well-developed views on politics. So you, know, you have to have an age limit somewhere. And by and large, and this may be an unpopular point to make in this room, and much though my experience of 17-year-olds is very, very positive in terms of those that I know are very thoughtful and intelligent and, and hmm. what have you, but I think 18 is probably about right. So I, I, on average. Uh, yeah, on average, it is the point where more or less you're leaving full-time education or going on to university. So I think 18 is about right, even though, given where I stood at the last general election, it would have probably helped me to lower it to, to 16. Should it be compulsory like in Australia? No, I don't think so. I think um, if people are inclined not to vote, then they... Uh, shouldn't vote. And look, here's an unfashionable, really unpopular and unfashionable thing to say. But I, I, during the campaign, I met someone who said, look, I don't really understand the issues, so I'm not going to vote. And I know we're all supposed to be, well, that's terrible and you really should understand mm. the issues. But I thought, well, actually, that demonstrated mm. some humility. Mm. Um, so if I don't think we should be you know, criminalising people because they no. don't want to vote. Mrs Brown. <laughs> Who do you think should win the Labour Party leadership election for there to be a real choice in the next general election? Oh. Um, I, I think, um, look, Keir Starmer brings a lot of experience, a lot of competence. He's not the most exciting politician, but he, he, he in some respects, he's quite prime ministerial. I think Lisa Nandy is, uh, is quite an interesting politician. I think she's got, I don't agree with... I don't agree with, with everything that any of the candidates say, but she, she, I think, would be a bit of a challenge, particularly for those northern seats that the Conservatives won. So I think she'd be more of a threat in those seats uh, than the other candidates because of her attitudes, I think. And I think, I think she does understand the sort of disillusioned Labour, northern Labour voter in a way that perhaps the others don't. I think Rebecca Long-Bailey would be a disaster for the Labour Party. Uh, and I think, you know, that would be the continuity candidate. Uh, and I think the Conservatives would be rubbing their hands with glee. I've nothing against Rebecca personally. I, my experiences of her as an individual, she was always very pleasant. She was my shadow for, for a spell. But I think her politics and I think, you know, her... Her abilities are such that the Conservative Party would um, walk all over the Labour Party in those circumstances. I think Labour's two lead leaders from power at the moment. I think um, Lisa Nandy is, is impressive, and her, she talks about patriotism and loving the country, things which Jeremy Corbyn ran a mile from, it seems. But I think it would just maybe just crush her, and she's quite young, and it'd be the wrong moment for her. I think Keir Starmer would be quite a good opponent for Boris Johnson uh, in terms of rigour and being professional and just taking the, the debate on the detail. I think Boris Johnson is poor on detail. Someone like Keir Starmer, a barrister, QC, would, un, would unpick that quite effectively at the dispatch box if he can get past Brexit in his head. I mean, he's got to recognise that Brexit is now going to happen and he can't fight it anymore. If he can get past that, 
he can start talking to our readers because Jeremy Corbyn refused loads of time to come on my podcast. There's all sorts of areas where our readers, The Telegraph, may want to listen to Labour on rail privatisation, old age care, rural poverty, key areas where Labour wouldn't talk to us. David Cameron always spoke to the, the Guardian in the old days, so Nick Watt, um, and sure David spoke to the Guardian, mm-hmm. and there's a complete lack of uh, uh, engagement with the right-wing press from Labour, which is a disaster. And until I start talking to the Telegraph, they won't win, win the election. So I think Keir Starmer is that person for them. And I think he's the person who David's former colleagues worry about the most. Well, that's all we have time for this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks to my guest this week, David Gork, and of course to the students and teachers at St Clement Dane School in Chorley Wood. Thank you as ever to the producer, Theo Ludis, and Edith Lampett, the editor. If you want more brilliant Telegraph content, go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. We'll be back on Friday with a special edition of Chopper's Brexit podcast on Brexit night, going out at one minute past 11, the first moments of Brexit. Do tune in. I hope you enjoy it. I certainly will. Until next time, cheerio.